Welcome to Bridge Community Church Thursday Bible Study. This is week five and is the last in the series, Getting to Grips with the Bible. In week one, we asked two questions. What is the Bible? How does it all hang together? Week two, how to meditate on the Bible. Week three, we began just to look at issues of culture and biblical context and saw how they could help us get at some difficult passages in the Bible. Week four, we focused on women in leadership and we did a sweep of the Old Testament. And now in week five, the final week, we continue on women in leadership moving into the New Testament. And if you followed last week, you remember that I, I said that the position I am in, my understanding of Scripture aligns with the Assemblies of God, which says, having studied the Scriptures, having tried to really get into it, um, we cannot see um, convincing evidence that women's ministry should be restricted. And as I acknowledged last week, there's loads of questions about that. And, and I could be wrong. I understand that and I accept that. So this week, the focus is on that 1 Timothy 2 passage. But before I get there, let me just briefly highlight some other things in the New Testament that are relevant to the discussion as a whole. I'm just going to do these briefly and there's, there's some key ones I'll miss out, but I just want to include these few. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, it tells us that men and women travelled with Jesus as he went from village to village proclaiming the Gospel. Including women like this was unusual, and as Craig Blomberg affirms, some would have seen it as scandalous. Still, in the New Testament, the culture was patriarchal, and in general, with a few exceptions, women were treated, as Daryl Box says in his commentary, as property or relegated to an almost invisible role. Jesus treated women and included women in a way that was in a very different direction to the culture. And there is that interesting story in Luke chapter 10 of Mary and Martha. And scholars debate what to make of it. You know the story. Martha is not happy at all with Mary because Martha's busy doing all the work while Mary is sat at the feet of Jesus. Scholars in general will point out that Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to his teaching in a way that men would when learning Torah from a rabbi. It is possible that the New Testament scholar uh, N.T. Wright says... Um, and it's possible that he's pushing the text too far, but with, along with others, he suggests Mary is joining the men in becoming a disciple, a learner, with the view to becoming a teacher. The second thing to note in the New Testament is Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. We have the story showing the women as the first witnesses of the resurrection. In verse 7, they are told, go and tell the disciples. And again, in general, scholars will acknowledge the significance of this, that in the, you know, the most Jewish legal context, the testimony of women did not count. It wouldn't even be heard. It's quite a thing to choose women to be the first witnesses that Jesus is alive. Here we have women as the first proclaimers of the wonderful gospel truth of the resurrection of Jesus. They were, as Craig Blomberg puts it, apostles to the apostles. The third thing to note is in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, there is a clear shift signalled and acknowledged. Acts 2.18, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those, those days and they will prophesy. There is a shift, a clear shift from what we've been understanding and what we've been reading. And I aren't referencing it, but you know the, the list of spiritual gifts in Romans 12 includes teaching as a gift and leadership as a gift. And the gifts are not gender specific, we know that. Fourth thing to note, in Romans 16, the Apostle Paul commends a number of females as co-workers. And they were not just there to make the tea. These co-workers laboured with Paul and he commends them. And what were they doing? They're clearly involved in sharing the gospel, in establishing churches. 
We don't know the detail, but we know they're involved on the front line. And in verse 7 of Romans 16, Paul mentions Junia, who is a woman, and he refers to her as outstanding among the apostles. Well, you can imagine the scholars debate exactly what that means, and it is disputed. But there it is, a woman referred to as an apostle. So now we come to 1 Timothy 2. And I'm going to read from verses 9 to 15, because I think this whole passage sits together. And it says this, Paul says, I also want women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness with propriety. This is the only passage in the whole of Scripture that directly says a woman cannot teach men or have authority over men. It is worth noting at this point that there is an example of a woman teaching a man in the New Testament. Luke says of Apollos, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately to him. That's Acts 18 verse 26. The Apostle Paul says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus, Romans 16 verse 3. It is highly unusual, the scholars will agree, for a woman to be named first. Priscilla is named first both by Paul and Luke. It demonstrates she was playing the leading role. Complementarian scholars like Thomas Schreiner and others say this passage in 1 Timothy 2 affirms that women cannot be pastors, they can't be elders, and they can't be bishops. And that this, he says, has been the view throughout church history. And the implication is that to depart from this view is to set aside what the church has always taught. The problem with this is that based on the 1 Timothy 2 passage, the historical position of the church was that women are more gullible than men. Augustine said that Satan approached the woman because the man would not have been as easily deceived. Thomas Aquinas said with regard to women, the power of rational discernment is by nature stronger in men. Hardly anybody would subscribe to that today. Hardly anybody today would say women are more gullible than men. In this 1 Timothy 2 passage, Paul says women should not braid their hair or wear gold, or pearls. And I, I include that in the passage because I think it's connected. But should we teach this in our churches today? You know enough, if you've followed this series, that to know that there is something cultural going on in these words. There is something going on in the background. And we wouldn't teach today that women shouldn't wear, come with a necklace with pearls, or wear a gold watch, or come with braided hair. We wouldn't teach that today. Something is happening in the background, and I believe the same is, the, is, the same is true for 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, when the Apostle Paul says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. I think there's something else going on in the background. Scholars of all persuasions say it is really notable the way the Apostle Paul starts, verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. The Apostle Paul actually says a woman should learn. This is the only part of verse 11 there is actually a command. The rest is about a posture of learning. A woman should learn. Stop there. That's quite radical. A woman should learn. Craig Keener says a better translation of quietness and full submission would be respectful attention, which is how everybody should be a learner. 
The encouragement for women to learn was progressive. It cut across the general practice in Judaism. This connects and echoes so much with the passages that we read in 1 Corinthians 11 and especially 1 Corinthians 14, where the women were asking questions in the service and they're asking questions because they want to learn. We would encourage people to ask questions today because we know that's how we learn. They weren't asking questions because they wanted to disrupt the service. And we saw that back in 1 Corinthians 14 that that, that was a, a, an issue culturally. So in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says to the women, you can ask questions, but don't do it here. Do it at home and ask your husbands. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul affirms a woman should learn and they should do that in an attitude of respectful attention. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. One of the immediate challenges with this verse is what, what is meant in the words teach and authority? Are they separate issues or are they to be joined and connected together? Is Paul saying, I do not permit a woman to teach and I do not permit a woman to have authority over men? Or is Paul saying, I do not permit women to engage in authoritative teaching? Greek scholars cannot agree on this. If you take the words as connected, as Craig Blomberg does, then the only thing Paul is saying women can't do is the authoritative teaching role in the church, which Blomberg and others understand to be the office of an elder, not even the role of a pastor. And that's why they would say, well, you can be a pastor as a woman and you can teach as a pastor, but you can't have, be an elder and teach because that is the authoritative teaching role. So if you connect those two Greek words, that's where you land up. If you take time to think that through, you'll see it raises all sorts of questions. So a woman can teach as long as it's not authoritative teaching. So how do you teach without any kind of authority? What kind of teaching is that? How would you define it? How would you make sure? How would you police it? It doesn't sit very well. So let me offer another way of understanding 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. One contextual issue that has an impact is that in Judaism, women did not have the opportunity to study the scriptures. In fact, the literacy rates for men and women were really, really low, somewhere around 10%. So if you take today in England, the literacy rates are around 99%, both for men and women. Go back to the 1800s and it was 60% men, 40% women. Go right back to this day, it's 10% as a whole, but men were five times more literate than women. There were some exceptions, and that was generally the wealthy Roman women, particularly uh, those from uh, the Roman background. In general, women teachers in that day were not the norm for good reason. Because of the issue of literacy, because of the lack of education, a woman teacher would be a rarity. It is possible that women teaching in church, which was a public gathering, as we've mentioned before, open to outsiders, it is possible that that was not helpful to the witness of the church. Just like we saw in 1 Corinthians 14, women asking questions of men, it was not helpful to the witness of the church. And if you doubt that the witness of the church was a driver for Paul's instructions, just read Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. The older women are to teach the younger women to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands. Why? Paul says, so that no one will malign the word of God. Because to behave outside of that would bring the, the, the faith into some kind of disrepute because of the culture. Verse 9, even applicable to slaves and slavery. Paul says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, not to talk back to them or to steal from them. Why? So that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. 
So for me, the issue around women teaching in Paul's day has got something to do with culture and something to do with a lack of education. What about women and authority? Paul says, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man. Here's the issue. Here's one of those passages where I mentioned in week one where there is a dispute over the Greek word. The Greek word Paul uses for authority is not used anywhere else in the whole of the New Testament. And that's a problem for translators because they usually look at other usages and get the best meaning of a word. Paul had other Greek words for authority that he uses elsewhere in his letters, words that would, would be very suitable if, if, he, if he was really wanting to make this clear, but he doesn't. He uses this relatively obscure Greek word. And this Greek word, its meanings include to control, to dominate, to act independently. Some of the newer translations of the Bible are reflecting this with the latest, the new, new international version saying, I do not permit a woman to assume authority over a man. And interestingly, the old King James version captures this kind of meaning where it says, I do not permit a woman to usurp authority over a man. So 1 Timothy 2.12 could be understood to be saying, I do not permit women to teach for now, and women should not seek to dominate or control the men. We'll come back to that. Verse 13 does raise a challenge in that Paul bases what he is saying on the fact that Adam was formed first and then Eve. And some scholars see in this a creation order, which is said to make whatever Paul is saying in verse 12 universal and timeless. If that is so, then Paul could simply be affirming that it is never right for women to try and dominate men. When we get to verse 15 of 1 Timothy 2, I mean, read that verse and you tell me what it means. You tell me what it's saying. It's very difficult. Scholars tend to scratch their heads as much as you and I do. What has childbearing got to do with it all? And it's Paul placing some kind of condition on a woman's salvation. Women will be saved through childbearing. What on earth is Paul saying here? So let me offer you a wider context that may explain the whole of 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15, which is why I've included the women braided and wearing gold and all this kind of stuff, because I think there is a wider context that can begin, begin just to help us see, wait a minute, something else is going on here. This context is debated, I understand that, though scholars like N.T. Wright and others affirm it. And if you did want to read deeper into this context, I will recommend Lucy Pepiat's book, uh, Rediscovering Scripture's Vision for Women, Fresh Perspectives on Disputed Texts. And the reason that I recommend that book is because Lucy Pepiat's book only came out in 2019 and benefits from the latest research. The general context of 1 Timothy is corrective. There were false teachers affecting the church in Ephesus, which as well as men also included women, according to 1 Timothy 5.13. Certain widows going from house to house, speaking things they ought not to. Ephesus, we do know, is dominated by the worship of a female goddess. Her name was Artemis. And the temple built in her honour dominated the city. And in its day, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And I know if you go to Western Turkey today and do the tour, there's, there's not much of the temple left, but there's bits and pieces. In Acts 19, we get a glimpse of the sense of the strength of the Artemis cult. This was not just some small backwater cult. This cult absolutely affected the entire city. Acts 19, Paul saw something of a revival in Ephesus, which eventually led to a riot. And the crowds gathered, and Acts 19.34 says, the people shouted in unison for two hours. 
Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Here's some things we know about the Artemis cult, and you will easily be able to relate these back to that 1 Timothy passage. And as I read them, I think you'll begin to think, wait a minute, this could be affecting what Paul is saying. So here's what we know of the Artemis cult. Artemis was a female-only cult that taught women were superior to men. The great god Zeus had twins, Artemis and Apollo, and the Artemis cult taught that Artemis was born first. And because of that, the female was superior to the male. And you can hear Paul speaking to that and saying, actually, the truth is, the real creation story is that the man came first. It's a corrective. To honour Artemis, and as an expression of worship, the women wore elaborately braided hair, expensive clothes, gold and pearls. Artemis was seen as a mother goddess, the source of life, and women prayed to her for protection in childbirth. This was a very, very big deal in that day. You could go back 100 years, 200 years. The infant mortality rate would not be great 100 years ago, 200 years ago. But you go back to this day and women dying in childbirth was not uncommon. So they would pray to Artemis, keep us safe in childbirth, Mother Goddess. In a hymn to Artemis, it's called Hymn 3 to Artemis by Callimachus. You can Google that and read the hymn. I'll, I'll read this particular part of the hymn out to you. It says this, Artemis will hardly ever go down into town. I'll live in the mountains and visit men's cities only when women, struck within fierce labour pangs, call on my name. For the Morai ordained when I was being born, Artemis, be helper of women. I think there is enough here to see that there is a high possibility that some of the women in the Ephesian church were once part of the Artemis cult. And some of them had come to Christ and some of them had joined the church. And while they were out of the cult, the cult wasn't yet fully out of them. And they still had some stuff. They still had some baggage, which often people new to salvation carry, that needed to be sorted out. And they were saying things contrary to sound teaching, which included that women were superior to men. And part of the Artemis cult would present that image and would seek to dominate men. So let me paraphrase what I think Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 to 15. Let the women learn. For some of them, there are things from the teachings of Artemis they need to let go of. So for now, let them learn. Let them learn the truth, and while being taught, they should do so in quiet respect and submission to whoever is doing the teaching. For now, I am not allowing the women to teach, and the women should not seek to dominate the men. In spite of what Artemis taught, the man came first, not the woman. And far from being superior, actually, the woman in the real creation story was deceived first. And the woman... You don't need to look to Artemis to deliver you or to keep you safe through childbirth. God is your deliverer and he will keep you safe. What you need to do is focus on growing in faith and love and holiness. I think given the background, that is a reasonable paraphrase of what is going on. So I would argue along with the Assemblies of God statement, I don't see convincing evidence in the Bible to restrict the role of women, whether it's female leaders or teachers or pastors or whatever it is. And in our own fellowship here at BCC, we have all of those. We have female leaders. We allow women to teach and preach. Recently, we had Heike preaching. We've had June Whitaker. We've had Manisha and Natasha um, we have pastors like Karen Green 
and Alicia, who's a trainee minister, we ordained Manisha and Natasha as pastors, and they are senior pastors of our daughter church there in Chandigarh. At this moment in time, we don't have female elders, but we are open to that. So I come back as I finish, and I hope you've got something out of this series, even if you don't agree with me, and you don't have to agree with me. And as I've said, as I've said before, on all the things I'm saying, I could be wrong, but it's, it's honestly where I've come to in my studies and my understanding. But I go back to Genesis, where it tells us, male and female, he created them, both to reign and to rule together, both made in the image of God, both commissioned to spread out from Eden into the world to subdue the earth, to build community and to do it together. Yes, they would have different roles. Of course they would. And that would be determined by the circumstances. Nothing is written down about what the role of a man should be and a role of a woman should be. But they would work that out as they went along. And together, together, seeing glory and honour come to the King of Kings, the King that they represented, the King that they were made in the image of. I'm convinced it's true in marriage, in the church, and in the workplace. Men and women are to lead and work together. Well, I hope you've got something out of this series. I really pray that God will bless you. And I pray that as you get into the Bible, remember, 90% of the time, you're going to know what the passage means. It's going to make sense. The challenging bit will be living it. And on one or two occasions, you might just want to look at the biblical context, read a few chapters around, might just help you with some of the difficult texts, spot those cultural words, which will also help you as well. And I just pray that God will bless you that as you get into the word. I pray the word of God will, will rule in you richly and that you will grow more and more in fruitfulness in Christ, in Jesus' name. Thank you and God bless you. Amen.